What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. Welcome to the very first installment of a new series in which I am going to deconstruct how and why important bands became successful. Today's video is about Bring Me the Horizon. If you're a nerd like me and you just enjoy trying to figure things out, trying to reverse engineer things, then I think you're gonna enjoy this one. And if you're in a band or you have a product to sell or you're just interested in marketing it for any reason, then hopefully you'll find some information and inspiration in this one. So let me know what you guys think of this concept and if you like it, tell me in the comments what bands I should do in future episodes. So like I said a minute ago, today's video is about the one and only Bring Me The Horizon. This band, believe it or not, is almost 15 years old now. They started in 2004. They have put out five studio albums in the past 12 years, each of which has become more commercially successful and more critically acclaimed than the last one. That's the spirit went to number two in the US and the UK. They headlined the very famous, the iconic Wembley Arena Stadium. Any way you look at it, they are crushing it. And just one note, to be super clear, this video and this series is not about me being a fan. It's not about my personal taste and it shouldn't be about your personal taste either. I actually don't like Bring Me The Horizon's music at all, but that's not the point. The point is that if you are a student of the game, if you wanna win, it's about when you see somebody winning, you go, wait a minute, how do they do that? What can I learn from it? So with that out of the way, let's get into it. What were the keys to success for Bring Me The Horizon? Key factor number one, their look and all these Sykes charisma. Now look, let's just be real. You take one look at Ollie Sykes and you say to yourself, that is a beautiful man. <laughs> I don't care if that sounds weird. It's just the truth and we all know it. But it wasn't just the look. I mean, obviously, as I said, he is a beautiful man, but there's a lot of beautiful people out there who don't do shit because what he has is the second part of that, the charisma. Now, what is charisma? The dictionary defines it as compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in in others. Well, I don't know. That sounds to me like it describes Ollie Sykes perfectly. And it's important to decouple looks and charisma because they're not the same thing. There's a lot of beautiful people who don't have charisma. For example, the 9 million other good looking guys that tried to start metalcore bands and went nowhere. And there are also some very charismatic people who are not good looking. Jack Black, for example. And then you have people like Ollie Sykes who are both good looking and super charismatic. These are the people who have the potential to be truly break out stars. But I think there is a critical difference between Ollie Sykes and so many other people with good looks and or charisma, which is that he uses it as a tool. I don't think that he's interested in attention for its own sake. He uses his platform, his charisma as a way to draw attention to the band's art. And this is an important distinction because so many other people put themselves ahead of the art. And I don't think Ollie does that. So one example of this from a few years ago, and I don't get involved with the TMZ scene drama. I'm not interested in that. But I think this is kind of a good illustration of how Ollie thinks and acts. So if you recall about five years ago or something like that, Sleeping with Sirens did a tour where they had an $80 VIP package. And as part of that package, you got a Polaroid with Kellen Quinn, the singer of Sleeping with Sirens. And a lot of people thought that was kind of off-putting and douchey. And Ollie Sykes was one of those people. And Ollie took Kellen to task for it a bit on Twitter. He said, next USA tour, Ollie Sykes, special Polaroid package. Take a photo with me, special price. Absolutely no charge at all, fucking cock stars. And then another tweet, I never wish to upset, it's just bullshit gets up my nose like a fart in a lift. Sometimes it's just so stinky. Someone has to say, come on, mate. <laughs> so that's key factor number one. Key factor number two, the band's incredibly strong creative vision and ability to consistently be two or three years ahead of the curve. And as I will explain in a minute here, two or three years is the sweet spot, I think. If you're any earlier than that, if you're five or ten years ahead of the curve, people just won't understand what the fuck you're doing. They won't get it. And if you're later than that, if you're only six months ahead of the curve, you're just going to get lumped in with the trend. But if you're in that sweet spot of two or three years ahead of the curve, that's what makes you a pioneer and an innovator. So I'm going to break this down into basically three eras of their career, three stylistic eras. The first era of their career, we could call the deathcore era, starting with their first album, Count Your Blessings, that came out in 2006. One important note, I think, is that this album came out on Earache. Earache is a metal label, pure and simple. Not just any label. They are the iconic 90s death metal label. They are the label that put death metal on the map back in the day with bands like Morbid Angel and Napalm Death and Entombed. All those iconic early 90s bands that put the genre on the map and established so many of the aesthetic boundaries that we take for granted now. Bring Me the Horizon is on the same 
label as them. Bring Me the Horizon was on the same label as Napalm Death and Morbid Angel and Entombed. Think about that. And if you listen to that album now, the production is pretty rough, I will say that. But all things considered that it was 2006, that they were a bunch of kids from Sheffield, they did a pretty goddamn good job. So if you compare it to the best of the genre today, maybe it doesn't sound that great, but if you compare it to what their peers were doing at that time, it is head and shoulders above what everybody else was doing. And that brings us to the second part of their career, which we could call like the hard rock era. This started with their second album, Suicide Season, that came out in 2008. This album is still heavy, but in a very different way than Count Your Blessings. This is much more of a slipknot, you know, new metal influence kind of album. And as a reminder, in 2008, it was not cool to like Slipknot or to play anything remotely resembling new metal in 2008. It wasn't until maybe 2011, I would say, when Suicide Silence put out The Black Crown. I think that was the beginning of new metal coming into deathcore and being acceptable to like. So this is a great example of the pattern that I was talking about. In 2008, deathcore was really exploding, but they had already moved on to the next thing. In 2009, they made another move that was super ahead of the curve. They put out an electronic remix album. Again, this is 2009, several years ahead of the EDM craze. So basically what they did is had 10 or 12 people or whatever remix songs from Suicide Season in various styles of electronic music. And if you look at who did the remixes, like look at the list of people who did them, you'll see their vision, their eye for talent. You'll see that they didn't just pick random DJs who they happen to know. Two of the names that stuck out to me are Ben Weinman from Dillinger Escape Plan and Skrillex. So what other scene band in 2009 was working with Ben from Dillinger? Think about that. Think about what that says about their taste level. And Skrillex, obviously, a couple years later, became a giant global megastar. They saw the potential in him years before anybody else did. They were working with him back when he was just the kid from first to last that's a DJ now. So that was the second era of their career. And the third era of their career is what we could call the rock era, which started the next year in 2010 with their album that has the really long name that I can remember that's There is a Hell and something, something, something. This is where they turned the corner to becoming just a straight up rock band where they really started to get critical acclaim and where they really started to separate themselves from the pack of other scene bands. And then in 2013, they released Sempaternal, which in my opinion is the one that really cemented them as the band they are today. There are a few kind of heavy parts in the album, but really it's just a rock album. And as a reminder, this is when every other band was still doing metalcore. In fact, this might have been peak metalcore. This is the year, 2013 and 2014. Memphis May Fire went to number four on Billboard. Crown the Empire went to number seven. We Came as Romans was number eight. Of Mice and Men was number four. So think about that. In the time when all these other metalcore bands were at the top of the charts, they had already moved on to becoming a rock band as most of those other bands would attempt to do in the coming years. And most of them failed. This is maybe like the best example of them being able to see around the corner to be consistently ahead of the curve. All these other bands were on top of the charts, but they could see that this bubble was about to pop. And it did. Like I said, Memphis May Fire went to number four in 2014. Their next album in 2016 was number 42. A bitter pill to swallow for all the bands who were still trying to do metalcore, but not a problem for Bring Me the Horizon because they had already moved on. So that was key factor number two, their incredibly strong creative vision and great sense of timing. And last, but definitely not least, key factor number three, consistency. They have consistently executed their vision better than everybody else. And this is an incredibly important point. I really cannot emphasize this one enough because having a great creative vision doesn't mean jack shit unless you can consistently execute that vision. Because there's lots of bands who have done maybe one great song or one really good album album, but then everything else they put out fell flat. But Bring Me the Horizon is the exact opposite of that. They are as consistent as it gets. They have never had a dud. Everything they've put out has been solid. Every album has been bigger than the last and has been better received critically than the last. And so they've proven that it was not a fluke. They have proven that it was not luck. They've proven that they can consistently execute their creative vision better than anybody else in their genre. As one example of this, of how they consistently push themselves and insist on the highest standards, look at the producers that they chose 
chose to work with on Suicide Season and the album with the really long name that I can never remember. If you're a production nerd, you'll recognize these names. If you're not, I'll tell you about who these people are. They worked with two guys, one named Henrik Oud, who is an absolute legend in the kind of Scandinavian metal scene. He's worked with bands like Demon Borgir, Architects at the Gates. Another guy they worked with is named Frederick Nordstrom, also an absolute legend. He's worked with some bands you have probably heard of like Arch Enemy, Opeth, In Flames, and Soil Work. So back then, 2008 to 2010, most bands in the genre back then were going to all the same studios, all the same producers who were just cranking out one formulaic genre record after the next. But Bringing the Horizon clearly made a deliberate decision to do something differently, to work with the people who had produced the very best artists in a genre completely outside their own. And you can tell because these albums sound fucking great. They didn't settle for good enough. They didn't settle for what everybody else in their genre was doing. They pushed themselves to do something that was just on another level versus anybody else in their genre and the results speak for themselves. So that is key factor number three, consistently great execution of that brilliant creative vision that I talked about in key factor number two. Okay guys, so here's the big takeaway. If you want to be truly elite as a band, you need to have all three of those things. You need to have the charisma, you need to have the creative vision, and you need to have the ability to consistently execute that creative vision at the highest level. Okay, so that wraps it up for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this format. Also, let me know what bands you'd like me to do this on in the future. I've got a couple ideas, but I want to hear what you guys think. If you liked this video, if you found it entertaining or informative or anything else like that, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel if you're already subscribed or for some bizarre misguided reason you don't want to subscribe like the video leave a comment with share it with a friend anything you can do to help spread the word would be very much appreciated okay and with that i am going to sign off for now but i will see you next time